everyone. Welcome to Because. I'm your host, Mark Zyla. On this episode of Because, we hear the becauses of pianist and educator Marion Lee. Marion Lee made her New York City debut at Carnegie Hall as winner of the Artists International Award and has appeared as a soloist internationally in Austria, Belgium, Italy, France, Norway, and Russia, to name a few. Lee has also performed at Lincoln Center, the Kennedy Center's Millennium Stage, Seattle's Benaroya Hall, Moscow's Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff Halls, and the Hermitage Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, Russia. In liaison with the U.S. State Department, Lee received numerous grants in support of performances of American contemporary music abroad, and is a former Fulbright and International Research and Exchange Scholar. In 2022, Lee launched her YouTube channel, At Piano Club 88, to share her approach to piano technique informed by her extensive background as an educator and performer. Dr. Lee currently serves on the faculty at St. Ambrose University in Davenport, Iowa. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Thank you so much for coming on, Marion. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm excited to be here, Mark. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. So let's uh, start as we start most because interviews with uh, what is the beginning of your musical story? Uh, when did you start? Who were the people who uh, brought you to music? Well, uh, you could say that it's in my blood. Mm-hmm. My... I have a lot of famous um, musicians on my dad's side, Mm -hmm. and my grandfather was a very famous operatic tenor back in Korea. In fact, he's credited with having brought Western opera to Korea and sang like the first Don Giovanni, the first Tosca, and um, my grandmother was a pianist um, who accompanied him a lot. And what are their what are their names? Uh, my grandfather's name is Lee Inbum. In mm-hmm. Korea, they say the last name first. Um, and uh, what's interesting is he comes from a family of four, right? He's the oldest son. And it's a very famous family because the, the number two son was a concert pianist mm-hmm. who was taken by the North Koreans but made a, a, a big career in North Korea, mm-hmm. apparently. That's just what I'm told. Yeah. Number three son was an actor who unfortunately died young. And the fourth was, um, you know, a a daughter who was not allowed to do anything. But her son um, was actually a New York Times, the very first Korean to have a number one New York Times bestseller book. And ironically, um, guess where he um, got the inspiration for the book, where he started writing it? Um, I have no idea. University of Iowa, the International oh, wow. Writers Program. Wow, that's Isn't amazing. Isn't that amazing? Like, <laughs> that's, that's a pretty uh, kind of serendipitous yes. like, thing for you to be in that area that helped. Yes, you know, he wrote a him. book called The Martyred, and it hit number one, and it's the, he's the first Korean wow. in the United States to do that, accomplish that. That's amazing. So it's quite an amazing family, and so I think my parents were like hoping that I would <laughs> – also, you know, have some um, musical abilities. And so when I was young, they had an upright. And, you know, when I was like, I don't know, when I could stand, I just kind of plopped around on it. And they're like, oh, there it is. She's she, she's going to be a pianist. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Obviously, it's got to be piano now. <laughs> you know, and um, ironically, my dad was not allowed to um, be a musician because it was a hard life, his parents said. And so, you know, his sister was allowed to be a pianist, and she's a very famous piano professor at Yonsei University, which is like uh, equivalent to Yale um, mm-hmm. uh, in Korea. And um, But um, my dad is the one who inherited his voice. Mm-hmm. But when he would sing in the house, they'd tell him to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> if he would try to play whatever his sister played, they'd lock up the piano. Mm-hmm. So I think when... They had me, um, when my dad had me, he he and my mom, they just really encouraged me, you know, mm-hmm. and so uh, really hard. <laughs> right. Practice, practice, you know. Right, the, right. Um, but um, I think 
that's what you know um that's what helped me get started and mm-hmm. then i heard opera all the time because my dad was obsessed with Italian opera and because he he was kind of self-taught you know and um, he'd say Marion come on over you know uh, let's do this and and I was really young but I would right. be forced to sight read this stuff and so I think that's what made me a really great sight reader and right. learn music fast and and be able to follow um, you know um, singers really easily even if they jump around all over right. the place okay. um, from your sight yeah. reading day. <laughs> piano with your father. Yeah, who who was self-taught didn't really read music very well, but oh. he, you know. So, um and then um yeah, when it came time to make a decision, you know, funny enough, I really wanted my hero growing up was Connie Chung. Mm-hmm. And cuz you just didn't see Asian um people on TV and she was the first, you know, female journal TV journalist. So wow. I wanted to be like her and I said I, I want to go into media and my mom's like there's no money in media. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting in our studio now, <laughs> and uh, they're like, "Look at what you do well, and you want this and this and this." So, like, and then um, at the time, I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Okay, and my uh, teacher was um, uh, Professor Charles Chuck Fisher um, at University of Michigan, and so you know, as a high schooler, I that's where I would practice, you know, and so I hung out a lot with U of M. Um, uh, music students okay. and um, they're like um, when it came time to make a decision to go to school they're like you know my parents of course wanted me to shoot for the stars and I, they're like no don't go to Juilliard they they sprinkle broken glass on the keyboards oh, and, wow. <laughs> and they they listen and count how many mistakes you make and so mm-hmm. you know I really when my parents brought it up I said I started crying. I said, no, no way. I don't want to fly someplace like that. Right. And they're like, just try it. And so, um, you know, it, it just – so I did. I just tried it, and I got lucky. <laughs> and I, I got in, and um, that – going to school in New York City, mm-hmm. having one foot in the real world and one foot in school – I recommend that where, wherever you go to school, right. it's huge um, mm-hmm. if you are able to do that because then you have that um, – you have a sense of purpose. Like uh, it's not just for school. It's not just for a grade. Like you can actually make money and have right. gigs yep. and, and stuff like on that. Our, uh, on my last episode with uh, Mock Gergich, he talked a lot about um, his time in California when he was in school – um, at USC and talked a lot about it being a great place in the sense that everyone there was conscious of the idea that everybody is both in the real world and in school. So it was like this incubator, I think for ideas and for, you know, launching careers and, uh, in all these places, it's kind of amazing to see the breadth of what these students decide to do with that talent. And yeah. so um what kind of things uh let's let's jump back for a minute. Okay. We'll, we'll go back to Juilliard, yeah. but No, um, you don't need to, but I yeah, just no. thought I would pre- <laughs> show you how I st- no, got started. But um I'm always interested to hear about um stories with um musicians in their like teenage years where you're mm-hmm. like kind of becoming a person uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and you are deeply invested in the practicing that it takes and the commitment to an instrument that it takes to get to your level that you're at now. Uh-huh. Um, but there always seems to be a little bit of a duality there. At least there was in my life in the sense that, you know, yes, the horn practicing happened every single day, but it was, uh, let's get that done so I can go play baseball. Uh So I can go play bass in a metal band that I started with my friends. And Uh so it Uh wasn't that I necessarily like wanted to do this stuff more, but it was like, there was this ecosystem of my life in a time where like, I guess you're raising a teenager right now. Yes. And 
I'm, I'm sure he always jumps on his homework and, and all that stuff. <laughs> You're like, well, actually, actually he does. <laughs> he's kind of a nerd. He's a science nerd. So yes, he does. But, <laughs> but anyway, you know what I'm saying. Yes, in terms yes. Of like, teenagers have, have chemicals telling them to do other things besides piano practicing too. Yes. In terms of uh, becoming adults. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I have two stories uh, regarding that. Um, um <laughs> So I was, you know, I didn't practice like particularly a lot growing up, um, but consistent, but I had, I didn't have great teachers. Okay. Mm -hmm. But um, one thing we did, my dad was a professor at Ohio State. And so whenever Mm -hmm. we had summer break, it was long. And so we would take these long road trips with a camper and go to California and back. Mm -hmm. And um, so on one of these trips, um, their friends owned a piano shop. And then, <laughs> um, fortunately or unfortunately, um, that's when my mom learned uh, from them that their daughter <laughs> practices three hours a day. And um, then she said, oh, so you're going to start doing that. <laughs> and so that kind of like, oh, you know. Gee, but <laughs> Yeah. But I will say that um, on one of those those road trips – um, my dad, you know, they, they always played classical music. And so one of the tapes played was um, Arthur Rubinstein um, playing Chopin Nocturnes. And mm-hmm. that was the first time I felt the power of music because I was in the back of the camper just lying down. And all of a sudden, you know, um, um, Opus 9 number 1 came on and I just started to cry. Mm-hmm. Like, And that was my first, like, really deep experience. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like... Wow, you know, it's like I can't believe that there's no words or anything. It's not like you know, and yet it's just the pure power of that music. That sound, and so yeah. yeah, and so that that must have been when I was like in elementary school. Mm-hmm. And then I remember my dad had all these LPs of classical music and one of them was Van Cliburn and it had um the two Concert, piano concertos he won with at the mm-hmm. Tchaikovsky competition, the Tchaikovsky concerto and Rachmaninoff too. And I remember in the basement, like putting it on. And then I just, for some unknown reason, I started to like improvise dance to it. Okay. <laughs> like I just started throwing my body around to the music because uh-huh. it was just so, I cranked it up and it, it was just so powerful. And I was like, it was fun. It was exhausting. Like I really put out all this energy and I was like, wow, right. this is amazing. Mm-hmm. So those are like the, you know, two really powerful experiences I remember um, that music. music had on me. Right. And um, so I don't know. I just thought that would be fun to talk about. Right. And uh, definitely a foundation that was being built for your interest to take it into your adult life. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, to this day, Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, those Russian composers, are, and Chopin, they are my three favorite. Like, absolutely. Yeah. So aside uh, from um, learning to play piano and learning about this repertoire, you mentioned uh, your respect for uh, Connie Chung. <laughs> yes. What else? What else? Until impressed? she married Maury Povich. Let's get <laughs> you that didn't clear. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else were you interested in outside of music uh, growing up? Hmm, outside of music. I'll be honest. I, I mean, I tried synchronized swimming and stuff, but mm-hmm. honestly, uh, and, and I had a second instrument, which was violin. Okay. But at a certain point, I mean, because violin came, the reading of it came easily because, you know, pianists play both treble and bass clef. Right. But um, at a certain point, I realized I needed to make a decision because mm-hmm. keeping two instruments at a high level was just too much. Right. And um, I ended up choosing piano because I just, I didn't have the um, the whole intonation thing <laughs> with violin. Like, it sounded fine to me, but my teacher's like, no, 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 that's not, it's, you know, higher, higher, lower, lower. You know, just So that is kind of what made me pick piano over violin. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm embarrassed to say I really, you know, (laughs) didn't have any other really outside interests other than, um, piano. It kept me really busy with, of course, you know, um, my schoolwork. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, yeah, so I'm sorry I'm boring, but. (laughs) Oh, definitely not boring. And, uh, 
it's it's just interesting to see the breadth of background in in the guests in terms of um you know when i was talking to mock he was a you know a professional martial artist yes and then because I heard of that injury yeah. you know ha- became a guitarist so mm-hmm. it, for him it seemed you know yes there's this deep connection to music but the discipline that he learned outside of music like really supercharged his ability to put together his career almost as a second career as a teenager if that makes sense mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. you know it goes from that to um, you know, I've, I've heard stories of, um, people who go to Curtis to study oboe who end up becoming, uh, stars on the metrop- metropolitan right. opera stage. Yeah, and, later you know, they find they have a voice. Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> and so, uh, to me, like, I, I don't think that there is a, a preferred story. It's just interesting to see the breadth of it. So, um, I think one common, uh, thing amongst guests is, finding a place that nurtures their talent and it's a time in which um you know you're you're learning piano uh you're getting pretty good and then there's like this powder keg uh, moment where it's maybe a teacher maybe it's an environment where you had colleagues that pushed you or or a project that you were involved in that really made you kind of know that this this was something that you, you wanted to do. Uh, was that something that occurred maybe in, in college while you were at Juilliard? What was that environment like in terms of of launching you to the next level? Yes. So, you know, I, I told you that, you know, music was not my first choice as a teenager. Right. But that I just, you know, just happened to get in and, and I went and it was really environment because, well, actually, let me preface. Uh, I will say when I went to Interlochen Music Camp, mm-hmm. as a, I, I did finally realize, oh, I'm with my people. You right. know what I mean? Like I, I found my people who mm-hmm. I jive with. When in high school, I was, I was not popular at all. I, I had a tough time. You know, I had mm-hmm. my best friends and stuff, but I was not in the in crowd or anything by any means. Not like now. Dude, we, are, we are cool folks about we town. are totally cool <laughs> <laughs> at least with the music geeks <laughs> yeah, yeah no doubt <laughs> but um yeah so so then um when i was at, at school um in new york um that's when i again felt that i was with my people right. you know and i was friends with composers and pianists and violinists and like all these, you know, great musicians who were, you know, motivated and loved what they did. And it was, um, it was infectious and no one told me to practice and it was just on my own. And yeah, I mean, I was, I don't know if it was the, (laughs) that environment where you're hunting for a free practice room and like, so all of a sudden it became a precious commodity. And so it's like kind of a game, like I'm going to get that practice room. And so once you got it, like you got to stay in there and practice. And so, I mean, that's when I started to do the five to eight hours of practice a day, but that was my own choice. And then I, I really got into it. That's um, my passion started to really come out there. Mm -hmm. And I had um, my, my first teacher, teacher, um, Jorgi Shandor was a, um, is a Hungarian, very famous teacher. His teacher was Bartok. Wow. Yeah. So he studied at the List Academy. Quite a lineage. Well, yeah. What the funny story is he actually, the, the, the famous teacher at the day was Dachnani. And so he was trying to get into Dachnani's class. And so they said it's full and said, so, well, you know, we got this new guy here and, um, <laughs> You want to try him? His name's Bartok, and he's like, "Okay, I guess." You right. know, and, and now then you're like, wow, and then yeah, they ended up having this amazing partnership, and he gave the, the premiere of the first uh, of the third piano concerto, and so um, anyway, um, and at the time when I met um, Shandor. I was pretty lucky because it was like two years prior, he had just wrote a book on piano technique. Mm -hmm. And um, this book would become um, one of the staples in in piano pedagogy on on piano technique. Mm -hmm. And so... um, I so he was very into the whole his, his book and his teaching of it and so I really benefited from that and it really shaped my approach to how I read music and the motions um you know he breaks it down to five basic motions and you know I had been wanting to make a um 
a video on this because it's one thing to read it, um, but it was very, it's very dry. It's very, you know, academic, really scientifically written. And there was, I always in the back of my mind had a project that I wanted to, you know, um, bring this to life a little bit. And, but how is I, you know, how is I going to do this? And now with the invention of YouTube and all this stuff, I was really, I I decided like this summer, actually Mm -hmm. very recently to make a video on this because, um, now you can have all these video angles and stuff and, and really get show in detail, and very quickly, and you don't have to read a thick book, and it's not that thick, but I mean, do you know what I mean? And it could right. reach hundreds of thousands of people. And, yeah. and people can listen to it again, watch it again what? Yes. immediately. Yes, and, pause and, it and or... you can put the score in there and right. see what they're, you know, I'm talking about, mm-hmm. and and the cameras can get in real close. Absolutely. And so that's been really fun because that's kind of taken off, I mean, much more than I even imagined. Right. Um, and so... I feel, and I, I dedicate it to his legacy of teaching. Absolutely. So that's been really fun to do. And so he was, um, he was a great teacher. And then um, I had uh, the great Seymour Lipkin. He's a, a famous American pianist and mm-hmm. just a real intellectual. And um, but I would say my r- real um, s- um, big moment came when I. Got my Fulbright to study at Russia, okay. in Russia at the at the time of the Soviet Union, mm-hmm. and it was at the Moscow Conservatory. I wanted to learn the secrets of Russian piano playing because, right. you know, Horowitz and all these uh, sure Tchaikovsky, all these great pianists that I admire were Russian, and they just had this very unique sound, and I wanted to learn how to get it, and the, you know, of course, their technique and all mm-hmm. that stuff. So what? Even for me. Try to describe what that unique sound is. It is almost f- like a physical thing where I, I, I kind of describe it as like if you have a plate right in front of your face, mm-hmm. that you can almost touch that sound. It's so it's so tangent. Like, I mean, it's, it's so tangible almost, mm-hmm. that sound um, of the, me- the, the melody, um, the way they sing that melody. It's almost like you can touch it, you know, mm-hmm. and you know it's very unique. And so, I, and and when I the the, uh, the other great thing about studying in New York City is like you get to go to Carnegie Hall and you know, Avery Fisher Hall, and you hear I I heard Horowitz live at the Met, you know, right. I mean, and in Carnegie Hall and Sure Tchaikovsky and all these you know um, Polini, all these great musicians you're exposed to Laredo you know Argerich and I I was even an usher right um I was a a a sub usher Mm -hmm. and as as a student and it was wonderful because you get to hear these amazing people for free and that that's I think a huge plug for any student yeah try to get an assistantship uh, stage management assistantship at the Performing Arts Center at your school. Or if Absolutely. you're in a big city, um, go be an usher at the big Performing Arts Center because I think the number one thing, um, yes, it takes great teaching. Yes, it takes all the practicing. But it has to take an element of understanding what's possible. Yes. And you definitely get to hear and see what's possible when you go out and you hear things that you don't even know what they are. Right. You know, and and I got to work at the Cranert Center in Champaign-Urbana when I was uh, doing my doctorate there. And I saw like 10 times as many jazz performances than I'd ever heard in my whole life in that time. Right. And even, you know, this is jazz. I'm studying classical. And I just saw an ability in these players to transcend technique Mm-hmm. And do whatever they want to. And for me, that was like, that's what I want to do. Even if I play just in the orchestra and I know this repertoire and I can, you know, win an audition and, and all that kind of stuff. But I want to transcend my technique so that I can decide to do whatever I want to with it. And that was what's inspiring, I think, from seeing live performance even outside of, I know this piece, I want to hear it. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, like, um, you know, I'm a pianist, but I heard these amazing orchestras. You know, the U.S. is just renowned. But I also heard international orchestras, and I really understood – 
I don't know if it's as much now, but like how every orchestra had a their sound, mm-hmm. you know, like Boston Symphony had their was Seiji Ozawa had their sound that was really unique to them, and so like as a pianist, we're trying to we're always saying sound like a French horn, sound like you <laughs> right. know a flute here and like so like that helps you know mm-hmm. for sure, um, and and then I heard Jesse Norman and like it's just amazing. So, yes, absolutely, to the young listeners out there, go, yeah, work at, at these performance yeah, you centers. You can get paid, and it's yes. like school, too. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So let's uh, go to your Fulbright. Uh, tell us about that experience. It was – so this it, this is 1991, summer of – August 1991, and I finally – you know, it, it took a long time to get the approval because it's the Soviet Union, a lot mm-hmm. of red tape. So I finally – Finally, get over there, and well, one week before I arrived, it was the uh, uh, you know I, I arrived during the period of perestroika glasnost, which is the Soviet Union opening up to the world, right? So mm-hmm. at first it felt really good, right. <laughs> and and it was all positive and everything, but then. When I was there, that's when they, um, the hardliners, uh, the old, the Communist Party, they kidnapped Gorbachev, oh, wow. and um, they um, all of a sudden that Iron Curtain came down with a thud. Mm-hmm. It was um, intense. So um, um, at, it, it was summer. So I was a part of a international um, summer at the Moscow conservatory program Mm -hmm. and we were on the outskirts at a hotel um and um and so all of a sudden we start seeing kgb like they're very obvious they're like the secret service Mm -hmm. they're just very noticeable Mm -hmm. and then like you know we're trying to get information but like all there is on the tv is bolshoi ballet ballet at the bolshoi you know and then like you turn on the radio it's all classical music Mm-hmm. I mean, like, just any information was you're just cut off from the world, right? And it's interesting that they use classical music to, like, just yeah, shut it all off, right? <laughs> That's um, for another show, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, it was really fascinating because, luckily, it was a short lived revolution and blood, relatively bloodless revolution. Mm-hmm. And um, I stayed put. I was like, I fought so hard to be here. They're going to have to ship me out on their own dime. If mm-hmm. So I stayed. And uh, and then, you know, um, when the fall started, I started with the Moscow Conservatory. And um, um, it, was, it, was, it was like the wild, wild west because, mm-hmm. you know, the whole Soviet Union started to fall apart, you know, just like the Berlin Wall falling. Right. And I was... I realized I was there, um, and this is a part of history. And right. and so by by Christmas time, um, you know, Gorbachev had dissolved the Soviet Union, wow. and all the republics became independent. Mm-hmm. So in a in a way, what what I'm seeing now with Ukraine is just um, just awful because. I was there when Ukraine became their own, you know, republic, right. and just to see what's happening, it's just awful. But um, and so, you know, um, it, it, I learned so much. Um, but it was like the wild, wild west. It was very dangerous. Mm-hmm. There were like shootouts all the time, you know, in in people trying to start public. I mean, uh, yeah, their businesses, you know, right. pri- private businesses, and if they didn't pay mafia, you know, money, not mafia, but like black market money, protection mm-hmm. money. I mean, it was very dangerous, right. but it was also extremely exciting, you know, because right. everyone's trying to find their way now in this new world of, of theirs, you know. And possibilities. That and possibilities, you know. Um, but like, you know, um, um, so. Yes, and as a student in the Moscow Conservatory, that was an incredible time because here you are walking in the halls where, you know, Rachmaninoff studied, Skriabin studied, right. Tchaikovsky taught, like all these names you're seeing on the, these panels, you know, and mm-hmm. and there's such a um, – they're so conscious of their history and lineage, oh, really? you know, for every for – every, um, teacher you have they're very you know it comes from you know like uh, my teacher was Naum Starkman who studied with Igumnov and there's this whole hierarchy and 
very conscious of what school you belong in. Right. They're very, um, yeah, very proud of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and being an international student for the first time living in their dorms, that is, <laughs> I took plenty of pictures because it was, um, it was kind of disgusting to be honest with you. <laughs> it was uh, pretty disgusting, but um, you know, you're all in it together. Right. And so everyone's kind of in their misery all together. So it's kind of fun too. You mm-hmm. know, all the, um, and so I met a lot of amazing people there mm-hmm. and um, I, you know, you put up with the most, Oh, one interesting thing about the dorms there. Every single dorm room had a piano in it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It's like, like if you juxtapose that next to the uh, U.S. Yeah. experience, it's like finding a piano is like <laughs> a premium. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> you I know, mean, Eric, I, like you have to have piano practice rooms that are only for the pianists <laughs> <laughs> because... Yeah. Some clarinetist is going to take that room if they didn't. Keep no, it for every <laughs> single dorm room, That's whether amazing. there was a pianist in there or not, had their own upright in there. Um, I'm not saying they were the greatest pianists, but you know, but actually, the fact that they weren't great pianos forced you to, you know, really try harder to right. make good sound. Mm-hmm. And then they had like uh, the they had grands down in the basement. I called it the dungeon because mm-hmm. it was just horrible. <laughs> you had rats running across the floors, and oh you know keys were missing and pedals weren't working. And but you know for these crappy rooms, sorry about my language, oh, yeah. but like. Um, you know, people would wake up at 5 a.m. to sign the ledger to get the time to practice in these crappy rooms. Right. Um, and then also, you know, you'd go to um, then the conservatory, you know, also very early in the morning and sign up for these rooms. Mm-hmm. And it was, they were coveted. I don't right. know what it is with pianists and just – or I'm sure maybe with everyone, but like um, pianists in particular, we're just like – yeah, we're nerds when it comes to that kind of, but we're very competitive for yep. getting those rooms, and we'll do anything to get them. literally lines <laughs> to sign up at five a.m. It's crazy, right? At uh, Carnegie Mellon, we we just knew to get there early, so it was like uh, when I described that experience for me, it was you know eight a.m. to five p.m. was work time, and so we were there practicing all day long, and then as soon as it was like when you could clock out for the day then it was <laughs> then it was fun time but anyway we were all there mostly at 8 a.m. so we could get our room and yeah, keep it for and, the day right right so uh it's a common experience i think across yes <laughs> across, in all music in all music schools. i mean i remember practicing till 2 3 a.m. at right. peabody you know what mm-hmm. i mean i mean that's just what we do or the late <laughs> the late night practicing that's when you can Maybe sneak into the recital hall or something like that right. and get a good right. Session. Oh yeah, That's... I remember those. That's why they started locking them up. <laughs> right, <laughs> keep these horn players out of here. Um, so let's transition into your fully professional life. What what does that look like for you? How what does coming back from this Russian experience feel like in terms of, um, you know, I'm I'm leaving tomorrow, <laughs> and then you know I'm going to have to you know, start my career, I suppose. I may not start it, but it's it's time to go to work, I guess. <laughs> well, it's interesting because um, I did really luck out in the timing that I was there mm-hmm. because um, they were hungry for anything rush uh, uh, anything western coming from the west. Mm-hmm. So any any musicians like, you know, any you know, I got a lot of performing experiences. I got to play in really exotic republics like Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan and all these places that um and I had the support of the US embassy to go there because it was cheap honestly because it was cheap for them to bring to send me there because I was already in in Russia. And so I brought that experience back with me to the states thinking, "Oh, here I go. I'm going to start this great career." But, you know, I realized, you know, when you leave New York, then like, you know, for like three years, like I did, and all my friends had kind of left at that point. Um, And so I I was, I had to start from ground zero again. It was kind Mm -hmm. of sad, you know. Um, But, you know, um, you know, you still, you, you start all over again and you do it and you build your connections again. And, you know, these experiences did help, you know, get your foot in the door and things. Um, 
But that's when I decided to get a doctorate. And mm-hmm. so because um, – uh, and then I did my doctorate at Peabody in, in Baltimore. And um, I had a wonderful um, – another Russian teacher there, Boris Slutsky. Mm-hmm. And I just loved working with um, um, Boris. Um, and um, – I just learned that's where I really learned about Russian sound. Mm-hmm. Um, my teacher uh, was wonderful in Russia, but um, um, you know, here's the th- here's the thing: you think you're going to go to Russia and learn all these secrets of being an amazing te- you know technician and learn all that technique that they do there, but actually, all that happens when they're young. They're right. like from from they call it central school, you know. Their their music school they start them young. Mm-hmm. They're trained very hard. Um, so by the time they're in, in conservatory level, they don't even they don't all that's done all that technical training. It's more about interpretation and things like that. Right. So um, I ended up I don't know if I should admit this, but I ended up getting like a ghost teacher from from the Gnesson Institute. Um, mm-hmm. And that's where I learned a lot of really um, great secrets to like piano playing, which I, you know, pass on to my students here and stuff. Right. Um, as far as my professional experience here, well, you know, I just scraped like everyone else did, you know. Right. Um, and um, I did whatever festivals and concerts I could. Um, eventually, I made my way, you know, to Iowa. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I, I, I teach at St. Ambrose University. Um, I was fortunate enough that there was a position there. Um, I was married at the time, and, and he wor- had a job here. And it's very hard for a couple to get, you know. Right. So we thought it was very, you know, um, fortuitous. And so um, – yeah, and then that's how I ended up here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and for those non Quad City listeners to this program, the Quad Cities is a unique place, I think, in the sense that on a map it looks small in mm-hmm. comparison to a lot of the places that we've talked about uh, mm-hmm. today on mm-hmm. on this episode, but. It's honestly very rich in the sense that there is a collection of people within this community that crave to create. Um, There are people in this community that crave consuming that creative energy. And I've found this community to be, uh, I won't use the word easy, because um, I think the show has this nature of of pointing out that it's not that it's hard, that there's just a lot of moving parts to to everything that we do. When we make magic on stage, there are so many other steps behind the scenes that that we're really good at at making people completely unaware of. However, when projects here in the Quad Cities come to life, when all of that work is done, there is a appreciative and supportive audience there Absolutely. ready for whatever it is. And I've said this, um, you know, we were just chatting before we started recording that, you know, we've been related to the Quad Cities for about the same amount of time. Yes. Um, and for me, I, I've lived in this community now for six or seven years. And, um, and I, but even when I wasn't living here, I always said, let's like the QCSO can play commissions, and people care about it, right? you know, and that's just not a luxury that a lot of communities have, especially the size of community that we have here. So w- I-, I guess I kind of set you up to either uh, heap on more praise to the Quad Cities or challenge me and say that it's not that great. But what 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 has your experience been here in the Quad Cities in terms of its, uh, its uh, ability to, to kind of allow you to be creative and to come up with projects and to follow interests and then people want to hear about it afterwards it's the number one reason why i love living here you know Mm -hmm. um i'm so glad you said all that until i arrived here in the quad cities Mm -hmm. i literally moved every three 
to four years someplace. Right. You know, I was constantly moving, you know, and, um, you know, and I lived in amazing places, you know, not only New York and Moscow, but like, you know, I loved living in Delaware and Maryland and, um, and all these places. I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, Ann Arbor, Michigan, all these places. And, but somehow when I came here, I knew that's where I wanted to settle. Yep. I just something about the community here um, that I gained so much support that you just can't find anywhere. I believe me, I looked <laughs> everywhere. Right. I lived so many places, mm-hmm. and I've never found support like this. I've never sa- found people who appreciate who appreciated what I did and what I do, mm-hmm. um, and that's hard to find and mm. when you can find that you Im- you you appreciate it and you embrace it and so um absolutely mark i just from where i work to um all the teacher organizations that i belong to like qcmta fmta and the quad city the, the, the qc uh, qcso um wvik mm-hmm. you know all these wonderful organizations, my, my school, of course, and um, everyone supports you. And like whenever you give a concert, whenever I have even an inkling of an idea, you know, I would talk with Lance Sadlick and over at Galvin and say, what do you think? Can we do this? Yeah, it sounds great. And like it just every, it's always supported mm-hmm. or I speak with Naha about something, you know, or Brian Baxter or you or like Mindy and just everyone's or like the, the Valley Quad Cities, you know, it's right. like it's what you just have an idea and you. I don't know if it's the size of the place, but people are receptive. Right. They don't just shut you down. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I love that, you know, this, I texted you yesterday (laughs) and you're like, what are you doing tomorrow at 11? You're like, sure, I'll come by and we'll have a chat. (laughs) And, you know, um, the, the way that we do business here feels small town. And I love that. I mean, that's where I I come from, you know, a small town in West Virginia where you know everybody and here feels like that. And, you know, I was just thinking as you were talking, it's like, um, I think one of the greatest compliments that artists can receive is that other artists like what they do. And I think that's something here in the Quad Cities that's always present is that, you know, when I uh, give a recital... Who do I look out and see in the audience? I see you. I see Bill Campbell. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously my wife and family and all that. But it, it's folks that do this as well. Yes. And and it's the approach that we take of doing it for others. And but obviously, like I I pick music that I want to play, or I pick music that I think needs to be played, or or that people need to hear. But. I always end up loving those pieces as well, and they become pieces that I want to play. And But I want to share that with folks, and the fact that there are people out there to share it with that are also doing the same thing is, is so unique. Because it could very easily be a place in which we see, well, Marion has a recital this week. I have a recital next week. People aren't going to go to two recitals. Right. Yeah, they are. <laughs> They'll yes. go to everything. And so we can support one another. We we can Absolutely. see each other as uh, um, we're not competitive in that sense. We are just adding to this amazing fabric. And uh, I don't know. That's our QC love letter of the day, I think. But. I think so. <laughs> I mean, you go to any other school. Sorry to say this, but mm-hmm. a lot of these other bigger schools and and there's maybe because there's just so much going on that no one goes to anything unless they're forced to. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And like in my, you know, St. Ambrose, we have this casual classics concert and like all the all the full time faculty come to everything and support mm-hmm. each other. Right. And um, and and they come to things that are off campus, you mm-hmm. know, and to support. And, and I'm, I'm sure that happens at Augustana, too. Right. And um, 
and it's it's a beautiful thing because it doesn't happen everywhere. It really doesn't. I find schools of music to be very insular, and mm-hmm. and and actually, community members hardly come to anything, right? Right. And so, what I love the Quad City community. I mean, I put out one email, and it's packed. Yep. You know, and it's like they they love it, and they support it, mm-hmm. and they appreciate you, and you. You know, you you know it because they give you standing ovations and they they tell you how much they love it. They send me thank you cards like mm-hmm. through the mail. I mean, it's it's just wow, and that yeah. does not happen it everywhere. Not. It really doesn't, and when that's why it's so special here. For sure. Well, let's start to wrap up our conversation for okay. today, and I will uh, pose this question. And it's Uh-oh. probably a philosophical one that. We'll start with a huh, or an um, or I hope. (laughs) Uh, What does Marion Lee's artistry mean in the future? In the sense of, like, what kinds of things are you interested in accomplishing before all is said and done? You know, many years in the future, obviously. But, you know, you get to a point where in your career you, uh, in the beginning... You're trying to build something. Mm -hmm. And then once it's built, you have this moment of, well, what do I do with it? (laughs) And I think that that's a question that a lot of us asked ourselves when all of our artistic activity was kind of uh, removed from us during the pandemic is, you know, when I come out of this, what am I going to do with this going forward? And, you know... um, my answer to that question is, I, uh, I'm i just going to have fun with this from now on. You know, life is too short to be overly serious. And at its core, what I do is make, uh, I try to sound pretty <laughs> for people. And I try to excite people with music. Um, and I'm trying to entertain people and engage people with music. And uh, I think that just my general vibe is one of like, you know, I can play a Strauss one, but I want to talk to you about uh, how I feel like it's 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 heavy metal like Metallica as opposed to a high art. Um, right, right, right. You know <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying. But anyway, um, so, it, it, you know, I'm not looking for a particular answer, but I'm just kind of curious, like, now that you have built a platform for yourself you have established yourself within this community and you have many years in front of you to to make music what are the goals that you have what um what does that look like i think one of the great things that we do as musicians is we can always think and create you know we always have ideas and we're always thinking about what would be cool Mm -hmm. You know, and so I don't think that ever stops, honestly. I don't think there's an end. I think inherently as musicians, we're always learning. At least I feel like I'm a lifelong learner and I'll never get to the end Mm because I'll never know everything. And um, or like I'll always see things at a different way. And, you know, um, sometimes you're you know how like sometimes your greatest ideas come from taking a shower (laughs) Yeah, uh, I was t- when I came back to work after New Year. I had just come from uh, twenty hours of driving to West Virginia and yeah. back, and I was like, Jared was like, "Whoa, dude, you had a lot of time to think." <laughs> so my yeah. shower time is in the car. <laughs> yes, yes, long drives. You know, mm-hmm. all of a sudden you just get an epiphany. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, I should try that. And then, like what I said, like the great thing is you have this epiphany, and then you can talk about it to whoever and you can usually make things happen Happen. Mm -hmm. you know and so I don't think that ever stops and um I um I'm excited about this whole you know YouTube video stuff I mean I just started and I've done incredibly I I don't mean to be (laughs) pat myself on the back but I'm surprised how viral it's gone Mm -hmm. and so I'm and the comments of how people are really appreciating the stuff. They want more. Right. So I, I plan to do more because I love the fact that I can reach globally mm-hmm. um, and um, that I'm not just yeah, confined to my community and at school, whoever comes to school. Right. And I love the possibilities of what can happen with that. So mm-hmm. I'm c- kind of curious how that's going to go. Um, and... Um, 
just um, coming up with just program ideas. And, you know, we have great resources here like the ballet, like the art museum, and and the symphony and and great players here and a great teaching institution. So there's a lot to draw from. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always looking to see how to collaborate, you mm -hmm. know what I mean, um, with the great artists here and um, the great um, art institutions here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking forward to these kind of collaborations and like mm -hmm. even being here on this podcast is amazing. You know oh, what I mean? Okay. And so I, I think it's wonderful that you, you're creating something here that's different. That's not out there. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I wish you great success with oh, it. Well, thank you so much. Um, last question for today is now that you can look back on some eras, um, Again, I'm in a, a little bit of a um, mood to look back. Uh, the holidays does that for me generally. Um, and I can draw upon experiences from my musical life. And one thing I'm always interested in talking to people about is managing artistic and personal life. Mm. And how does that balance work? And I don't know, what kind of wisdom might you have gained through this entire story that you've shared with us to, um, I don't know, folks who might feel like they're in the, the depths of creating a career and they're not necessarily taking care of the personal side of life as well. Hmm. I'm not the greatest to ask on that because. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk As, about that, Marion. <laughs> because well, what do you what do you think, or how do you feel that that manifests in the sense that you don't feel that it's great? And I mean, obviously, you don't have I to mean, say deep uh, personal stories, but like, what does burnout feel like for you and, and stuff like that? Burnout is going to bed at two or three a.m. and having to wake up because you have a son who needs to get to school. At seven, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> so I get four to five hours of sleep. Mm -hmm. So I was, you know, I I am a single mom now, and um, I feel like I have four um, jobs that I do every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know, I I have my um, you know salary paying job, which is teaching at a, the university, and then um, I have my. After school, then I take care of my son. Um, and then I also have private studio where I teach um, kids in the area. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, then I have my <laughs> performing side that I, I feel is very important to keep up mm -hmm. my skills so mm -hmm. that I can be a, a great teacher to my students. And so and so I don't start practicing till 10 p.m. and I go till, you know, 2 a.m. And it's not every day, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then sometimes, yeah, you have your own committee work with, you know, at, at university. And so then so um, lack of sleep. That, that that's a big issue with me but i take daily naps i believe in i believe in power naps 20 mm -hmm. minute power naps yep. um and the, here's something interesting um and sometimes i take two cuz i'll take another power nap at night so i can keep going right so i try to live like two days in one sometimes mm -hmm. that's what it feels like but tesla i heard tesla like you know does the um did the same thing. I forget what it's called. It's, there's some, you know, scientific term for it. Mm -hmm. um, but he used to believe also, and I and did this. I had no idea until someone pointed it out. Hey, I think Tesla did it. And I'm right. like, oh, Nikolai Tesla did it. It must be okay. Right. I mean, you know. <laughs> He's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I've, I've uh, as a podcast listener as well, I, I hear a lot of commercials for like, uh, I think Sleep Number has a podcast now where they talk oh, really? to um, athletes and artists about how sleep 
plays into their creativity and, and all that kind of stuff. So I imagine if I actually listen to that podcast, because it's produced be by Mark Zyla and Jaron Michelle in the studios of WVIK. So, yeah, if your power now is working for you, keep going for it. So. Thank you for listening. Well, Marion, thank you so much for taking because some time I read to come because by Mo Willis, illustrated uh, by Amber Wren. Great I wanted to, hear, to learn the becauses uh, of people of I admire. Known each other for Do me a favor years, and thank someone in your own because story. <laughs> and join us next time. Thank you. This has been because. awesome speaking with you.